Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. There is a vastness in the wilderness in Alaska. The mountains are more majestic. Nature is undisputed master. There's something about this country that sets off in me a craving for heaven. The living conditions are a challenge, I can tell you. But the needs in Alaska far outweigh the challenges of living here. This is what Alaska looks like in the summer. Incredibly beautiful. Everybody enjoys getting outdoors in the wilderness. And here's the interesting thing. Most of our missionaries, their sole means of getting around are these four-wheelers. And that is a big challenge. If you can imagine us as a conference having to maintain so many of these little vehicles for our missionaries, this is how they get around. Unbeknownst to many Americans, Alaska holds the largest national park in the country. At 13.2 million acres, the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve encompasses a size bigger than the country of Switzerland and six times the size of Yellowstone. In its bounds holds many of the tallest peaks and largest glaciers in all of North America is designated as a World Heritage Site. But before it became a park in the 80s, it was home to many people. And today, there's a small but growing number who live at the foot of the Wrangell Mountains in a secluded town called McCarthy, 60 miles from the nearest paved roads. Rick and Bonnie Kenyon left Florida 36 years ago to come to Alaska, and they've fallen in love with its beauty and with the self-sufficient lifestyle. Well, it is a, a very beautiful spot, very nice part of Alaska. From a resident's point of view, it has a very nice climate, but it's moderate enough that we can have a garden. We had to build our own cabin. There's no, no grid here. We still make our own power, get our own water. So it's, it's not a lifestyle for everybody because it is uh, somewhat strenuous, but it's, it's enjoyable. McCarthy is so remote that mail has to be flown in on a small plane, an event that has become the major social gathering for the area. Mail days are very important <laughs> to our community. They happen twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. And uh, 11 o'clock, approximately 11 o'clock, our mail pilot flies in. We do our own mail sorting. We have a little mail building we call our mail shack. So that is our mail days. It happens twice a week, and they're, they're a big social event. <laughs> the Kenyans reflect the entrepreneurial nature of many Alaskans, who often do several different kinds of work. They run a bed and breakfast in the summer. They contract with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to do weather observations every day. And Rick is even the pastor of the community church. The law is just and holy, but it has no power to make us just and holy. Despite being so busy with all their jobs, they feel this mountain paradise gives them the freedom that they and many Alaskans are looking for. It is an Alaska concept to be able to, to be free to, to, to live on your own piece of property, develop it the way you want to. Uh, Alaskans are very self-sufficient people, and they, they like to be that way. We enjoy the, uh, the solitude, the peace, quiet, and the lack of traffic. 
Welcome to Bristol Bay, Alaska. This is where the mighty Nushigak River flows into Bristol Bay and then into the Bering Sea. The Nushigak River at this point is about probably five miles across. And every year there are five different species or runs of salmon that come up this river. The second run and the most heavily fished one is called the reds or the sockeye. There will be 40 million fish come up this river in a span of about 30 days. This is why this is one of the greatest fisheries in the world in this area. Starting about the middle of June, there will be 800 boats that are launched and will begin fishing in this river. Some of the Adventists have a rich history in this area of Alaska. Elder H.T. Watson came to Alaska in 1901 and settled in the area around Juneau to become a missionary there. As he uh, worked in that area, he received news that this area, a native village called Kanakanak in Bristol Bay, had been devastated by tuberculosis. Of course, in those days, they didn't know what it was. But the whalers brought two things. They brought white man's disease and they brought fire water. The tuberculosis or influenza that they brought destroyed this village and most of the adults passed away. And so he appealed to the government to be able to come and to help start an orphanage for the children. He arrived here in the early 1900s, probably about 1920. And he started an orphanage in this little area here called Kanakanak. The orphanage grew and prospered and soon there were other villages that were asking for the same thing. Because of the success of this one and the devastation among the Eskimo population, they asked if he would come and start other orphanages. The Seventh-day Adventist work began here with the orphanages that Elder Watson started back at that time. As that the need grew and the orphanages grew, now you'll see a beautiful big hospital that's situated on the original site of where that orphanage that Elder Watson started. I'd like you to meet one of those children that grew up and actually went to Bristol Bay School here. His name's Joe Chaitlin. Well, I come to Dillingham. This is the Dillingham Boat Harbor. We're ready to move out to the bay to try a, a day or so of commercial fishing. And it's quite a hassle sometimes to get away because of being tied to a bunch of boats. Nobody's on them. And, and uh, we have some folks here to help us pull the other boat. I will be on our way shortly. Oh, thank you. We're having a little meal here before we get out the bay. In this boat, we don't have too many vegetables. So we do what we have. We're not vegetarians. We're, we're meat eaters. Alaska Native Christians from, uh, from up in Dillingham area. I think this particular meal is um, made from moose burger. A uh, little potatoes and then a little bit of, I don't know, corn maybe on the side here. Won't be good for a couple hours. <laughs> the Lord gives us what we have and we thank him for it and we eat. My fishing crew here with me today is uh, I have Jonathan David from uh, Nunavak Island. I also have a young man here, Colby Halakayak, from Dillingham area, Manakodak. And then Roy, Roy uh, Baruchta, he's from uh, Manakodak. He's been on many different boats. I'm happy to have him on his boat this year. He, He's the one that kind of keeps these younger guys in line when, when they need some guidance, and uh, I appreciate him. When we're out fishing hard, we need to have plenty of food and what's not on board. Even though people aren't part of your family for the rest of the year, they're your family while they're in the fishing season, and you take care of them like you would any other and any one of your uh, regular family members. So the crew will be in good shape.
Usually when it blows like this, there's fish, but this summer hasn't, hasn't been the case. It blows like crazy for nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think a simple diet years ago prevented people from getting diabetes and other things that uh, we've acquired. And a lot more people sit around and not do as much outdoor activity. And in the villages, you see more people just riding a four-wheeler just down the street instead of walking. So people today are getting too lazy. We must not conclude that everybody's affected. There's still a few people who live a traditional lifestyle, and they do a good, they do a good, uh, they live a good life. when you uh, depend on fast food and what's not. Instead of growing tall, they grow wide. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wendell Downs. I'd like to invite you along with us today. Uh, we're at Dillingham, Alaska, at the Avenist World Aviation Hangar, and uh, we're going to be going in the Cessna Hawk. Uh, we're going to go out to Ekuk Beach, which is about a 20-minute flight from here, and we're going to be uh, taking a letter out to a young girl who wrote a letter to God. And uh, I'm not God, but I told her that I would come out and, and visit her. So we'll, we'll uh, have a nice flight out there. I'd like to invite you to come along with me today. And uh, we'll see what we find as we get out there. Fishing uh, has been a long-standing occupation in this area. In fact, it's the major occupation in this area. This particular year, fishing isn't as good as the fishermen would always hope it would be. But uh, uh, right now we're in the middle of the red season. King season is pretty much over. Get out a little bit farther, you'll actually be able to see quite a few boats out in the bay. Fishing Egg Point is right ahead there. You can see a whole fleet of boats out on the water. I spent my first summer here in uh, 1967, right on that beach over there. I uh, fished that season. It was the worst fishing season in a, they said in the last hundred years prior to that. I think they've had some more like that since then. This season actually is uh, probably going to be better than that, but. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I really appreciated and enjoyed my time here, just south of Michigan Point, where I actually made my commitment to become a pastor to the Lord, that I would no longer be Jonah and run from him. So that was an important time for me. We're in Alaska. We're not doing a whole lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I decided to mend a net that uh, that has needed some mending for a while. Adding a piece that was caught in the, on the reel when we were laying out or something. And uh, my family, historically, my mom and dad put up a lot of fish. And then when I got married, we did the same. One of the first things that I, I learned how to do everywhere I find a place to camp is make a little fish rack and I found I'd be there long enough to also make a little smokehouse so that we could dry fish and smoke them. Put them away for the winter. When they're all gone, you have something to eat. We are to serve the Lord in season, out of season. And I think that's very true with, the, with how we live. We, we prepare for this life that we live anyway. 
in season, be prepared in season, out of season. It's not such an issue today, but boy, I remember when I was growing up <coughs> in uh, villages where grocery stores and whatnot were not available, people didn't put stuff away. Come March, April, even February, they run out of food. So the village folks that have would share what they have with them to have to make it through the winter. But it's you know, kind of funny how people are. They promise that they're going to get squared away next summer and have fish and prepared and put away for the winter. But when summer comes, things are warm and they're not hungry anymore, they forget. And some same people have a problem over and over again. The relationship with the Lord is very same. You can't just put it off. I guess it's uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christians were probably the only ones that know it for except for some real orthodox orthodox uh, Russian believers. They take a day off every weekend and go worship the Lord. And uh, it happens whether the fish are running hard or not. And Sometimes as a result, uh, you might miss a, a good day where you have an opportunity to make some money for the winter. But yeah, I guess in my experience, I've seen the Lord provide many different ways, even though I may not catch as much uh, that certain day. The Lord will also provide fish on other days when there's no fish in, in places. Your religion's not based on uh, having the Lord give you everything you need but providing you for you to sustain. One of the things that the Lord's Prayer mentions is give us this day our daily bread. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding that. I think that uh, we need more than just daily bread. We, we need to have a lot of stuff for next, next day as well. I think it's not enough to try to gather more and the next day it's spoiled. <coughs> so, I think the principle is there, you know, God will supply all of our needs according to our needs. Well, our, I think our Christian experience, <coughs> our Christian experience as we witness is somewhat, or, a net is sort of like a tool to catch fish and uh, our lives are very similar. If we have a, <coughs> a good relationship with the Lord uh, and, and ask for forgiveness and stuff from our sins <coughs> every day and make sure that we're in tune with Him, uh, everything works right and catches fish properly, but then we lose that relationship and we kind of rely on our own stuff. Our life gets kind of messed up, gets snagged or torn and uh, no longer functions properly. <coughs> when we realize that, I guess we can ask the master mender the one who made the net. Take and mend the net. And 
and make it able to catch fish the way it should be again. Jesus' uh, invitation was, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It took him a while, to, I think, to realize that. I know it, it takes all of us a long time to figure out what our real job is, and that is to be fishermen for men. <laughs> One thing that I've been kind of thinking about as well is that, uh, you know, we've been with this mission work and Eddie work in Alaska for many years, and it just seems to not be getting us anywhere, maybe I don't know. Remind me of uh, Jesus spending three years with his disciples, and look, seemed like he wasn't <coughs> getting anywhere with them until after his resurrection. He met up with them, and <coughs> they were out fishing. <coughs> They hadn't caught a fish all night. So he told them, well, throw your net on the other side of the boat. <coughs> and uh, they did that, and man, they, this might have been a, an earlier story as well too, but I guess the point that I, I see from that, I think sometimes we're not catching fish in the way that we've been doing it for a long time. We need to change our strategy to think of something else that might work. So there's a small community that lives right here at Nishkek Point. Uh, not very many in the wintertime, one or two, and then the rest come in the summertime. There's a little beach that's sort of the front uh, street in this little community here and we'll be landing on that. Welcome to Ecook Beach. We're gonna go see if Lil Hildy is home. <clears throat> uh, good morning Hildy. I have a letter for you. This is an answer to the letter that you sent me a while back. And I also have a gift for you. It's called Kid Zone. And uh, those are some Bible lessons that uh, if you were interested, you could fill them out and you can send them back in. Say hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. How are you doing? Do you know where we might find Albert? Yes. When you go down this road, there's a warehouse on the right, mm -hmm. and you start to come to all those brown houses. Okay. He's the first one you'll come to. I came to Alaska in July of 1931. The way of life years ago was you trapped in the winter and fish commercially in the summer. I decided that dog teaming was not the best way to get over the tundra so I started learning to fly a number of planes family cruiser to start with Fokker Super Universal Travel Air 6000B my favorite was the Grumman Goose and the Widgeon when we got started with the airline, I became the president of the airline, Western Alaska Airlines, for nearly 30 years. Lifted my voice many times to the heavens above. Flew the year around, fought weather of all different dimensions all my life, but never did my Heavenly Father leave me. I was well blessed by my flying with my Lord and I. I flew a little less than 20,000 hours and never scratched a finger, my Lord and I. Albert, my grandfather, he was fishing up on the combine with a 
skiff and he got real tired of that. It's a real hard way to fish. And uh, he decided he wanted to do more of a family operation and he'd heard that there was quite a few fish on Ecock Beach and, and he had had a little experience in a sailboat down here on Ecock Beach. And so he uh, flew down here one winter on skis and his Norseman and landed on top of the bluff by First Creek, watched the ice flow and looked at how it came in on Schooner's Channel to the beach and picked his spot where he wanted to stake the sites and he staked several sites for his family and his brother's family and he's responsible for keeping most of the family in power and water and and good uh, good company you know as i mentioned i'm reading the desire of ages and they're just about to crucify my lord but we have the promise that he'll never never leave us no matter what he states emphatically to remember the seventh day to keep the Sabbath. It's a command. And like I said before, no matter what I did, operated the airline, I testified in the and my testimony is in Washington, D.C. that I will operate, but I will not operate on the seventh day of the Sabbath. I had no schedules whatsoever in the airline for Sabbath. The Lord is blessed beyond any way you could ever ask or think. That is how we got started on Ecock Beach. And we've been doing it ever since. And I give all that credit to my loving Heavenly Father. He gives me every breath I breathe. He's given me family. We're getting ready to pull our gear and pick the tides Going out, we usually pick about two to three hours after high water, and we're headed down here in about an hour, pull up the gear and and uh, start start Sabbath, and and uh, Albert and, and uh, Eileen usually have a little pie social of a of a Sabbath where we all get together and have a little have a little Sabbath fellowship and some good food. For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information.